Hello everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about early photography. Um, so let's talk about some really early photography. So you have these slides and you have my notes so you can look a little more into some of this really early stuff um, on your own. But basically, I don't like to just jump in and uh, start at daguerreotype and say that that's like the first thing that happened in photography because that's not the case. So um, the first important discoveries related to the history of photography actually happen as early as the 5th century BC, and they happen in China. Um, so we have Chinese philosopher Mo Ti, sometimes called Mo Zi, with a Z, not a T when it's translated to English. Um, he's the first guy to mention this idea of an obscura device, which later we know as a camera obscura. Um, he recorded the inverted image formed by the light rays passing through a pinhole in a dark room, and these dark rooms were, were sometimes called the locked treasure room or the collecting place. So he invents pinhole photography. He's this very uh, brilliant Chinese philosopher. He has a lot of important other contributions, but we're mostly interested in this one at the moment. So he's kind of the first guy to come up with this camera obscura idea and the idea of pinhole photography. Jump forward a little bit um, to 384 BC. You've all probably heard of Aristotle. You are at least familiar with the image of him by um, Raphael that we see here from the School of Athens in this image, uh, which we studied when we were looking at Renaissance painting in Italy, right? So Aristotle is able to understand this idea of the uh, camera obscura, and he particularly notices this phenomenon when he's trying to figure out a way to look at the eclipse without harming himself, because as we all know, um, if you stare directly at a solar eclipse, it's, it burns your eyes, it's very bad for you, so you don't want to do that. So he was trying to figure out a way to observe this phenomena, and um, he figures this out. He noticed that the crescent shape in a partially eclipsed sun aimed on the ground through the holes in a sieve, um, you could see you could see the the leaves and things in a tree as well. So he noticed this this phenomena of um, an image being inverted through a pinhole when exposed to light. So jump forward a little bit. I know I'm moving kind of fast, but there's a lot to talk about, and I don't want this to be a super super long discussion. So we jump forward a little bit, and we're over in the Middle East. Um, we have this, um, Alhazen is his name um, in English. Uh, he's a philosopher and a scientist and inventor. Um, and he comes up with most of the theories that relate to modern optics, okay? So he's talking about not just the idea of camera obscura and, and pinhole photography and this kind of things. So he's also looking at how our eyes work and how our eyes perceive optics. These are some of his drawings and notes on the side here. Um, so he publishes these works um, explaining kind of how the human eye works and how our eyes perceive and how our eyes act as a lens. And he's kind of the first guy to really start figuring out the role lenses eventually play in photography. So he's quite important in the development of optics in general and also for our purposes, how they uh, relate to the development of photography. Okay, this is a guy we know, Leonardo da Vinci. We have talked about him. He's, of course, a great uh, artist and also an inventor, as we talked about, you know, being the Renaissance man, he has all these different interests. And one of his interests is camera obscura. Um, so from his notebooks, this drawing at the top is one of the drawings from his notebooks, which if you recall, I talked about how he left extensive notebooks with lots of his ideas for inventions and his um, theories and things and also sketches. Um, so he wrote two clear descriptions of camera obscura in his notebooks. Um, many obscuras were in, done in large rooms. This was illustrated by the Dutch scientist uh, Jim Afrisius, um, and, and this was used to view a solar eclipse because they read about Aristotle's experiment there. But after da Vinci starts exploring this technology, this idea of camera obscura used to produce images that could then be traced, like uh, other Renaissance artists start using this technology, basically. So he writes about it, he draws images showing how to do it, and then it becomes a, a part of, of practice for a lot of um, artists in the Renaissance, particularly in the Northern Renaissance. Um, one such artist is Vermeer, who we talked about. 
Um, so Vermeer, it's widely believed, was um, was one of the artists who used the camera obscura technique to make the initial tracings on his uh, canvases, the underdrawings on his canvases for most of his works. We looked at um, a couple of his. He's famous for doing those interior shots where a person was sitting in an interior area in their home. Um, so he would use a large scale camera obscure to produce the initial image and then he would go back and pose the model for it to, to capture the color and the light and everything. Okay, the actual phrase camera obscura was first written down by a German astronomer named Johannes Kepler. So it's, I just like to know where words come from and so that's where we get that actual term. And he um, had this little illustration explaining kind of how he used uh, how he would set up his camera obscura. Okay, so let's talk about early photography in the 19th century. That was a very quick like kind of run through of many, 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 many years of history leading up to this invention. But essentially, I didn't want you to just like drop in a daguerreotype and not know where anything came from. So, okay, early photography. Let's talk about Louis-Jacques Mandé Daguerre. Uh, he lives from 1789 to 1851. He invents the earliest widely adopted photographic process. And he is the earliest in widely adopted process by like three weeks. So we'll talk about that. Um, this becomes named after him. His last name is Daguerre. So these are called daguerreotypes. That's the name of the technique. If you ever, if you're from this area and you ever went to Silver Dollar City, um, down in Branson and had a tin type made of you. Um, so you you know that some early uh, photography forms have type at the end. That's pretty typical uh, for this form. So daguerreotype is named after Daguerre. Okay, so let's talk about this guy. Um, invented nearly at the same time is a similar technique that's created um, by the Englishman William Henry Fox Talbot. Daguerre is French, if you couldn't tell by his name. So these things are created at nearly the same time. Talbot lives from 1800 to 1877, and he invents something that's called the calotype, which we will also talk about. That's C-A-L-O-T-Y-P-E. Okay, so Daguerre, he's, um, he's an architect. That's what he studied. That was what his professional practice was in. But in addition to being an, a conventional architect, he's also a set designer. He also designs and paints sets for plays. And when he's doing that practice, he comes up with this idea. So he has an idea and he opens this place called the diorama. When you were in elementary school, you maybe had to make like a little shoebox diorama showing something. I feel like I had to make one showing um, different kinds of home building techniques of Native Americans. I maybe had to do one about dinosaurs once too. I don't know if they have us make these things in shoe boxes as kids. That's a diorama. That's the same kind of idea, except these were quite large. Uh, so he opens this place where the audience experiences living paintings is what they, he called them at his diorama. So what he did was he painted, he did like a big stretched painting, like a, like a set piece, like a set background. But then in front of it, he had translucent curtains that had other things painted on them. So when he shined light from different directions, different layers would show through, okay? So it looked like the painting was changing in front of their eyes because the light would make the um, op opaque painted areas show up and the translucent fabric disappear, okay? So it's kind of like a, a trick. So he created this sort of trick. Um, so what to, to make these these living paintings for his uh, diorama theater thing that he came up with he used the camera obscura technique he had read about you know how da vinci and other people used this so he used this technique so that he could trace his um his designs more easily onto his sets and he thought that this was you know great but he wanted to find something that was more efficient. He thought that there could be some way to directly capture the image and put it directly onto um, the, the canvas, onto the set, rather than having to trace it and then paint it. He thought that there had to be some way to, to make this camera obscura idea um, more fixed and more permanent. 
Um, okay, so he hears about this guy and, and meets him through a mutual friend. So he has this acquaintance named Joseph uh, Nesifo, uh, Nip, uh Nieps. His name is very tricky, N-I-E-P-C-E, -E, Nieps. So he hears about Nieps, who's this um, very smart guy. Uh, he's kind of an inventor. And so he hears about him, and he hears that he has figured out this way to um, success successfully create a permanent photo, not something that has to be traced, that's projected temporarily and then you trace it, like camera obscura, but something that permanently fixes um, the image onto the page. And so he was very curious about this. So he finds out that he used a camera obscura with a metal plate that he covered in a light sensitive material. So he finds this guy, Neeps, and he um, is very interested in how he did this. When he finds out is that Neef's process worked, but it took like eight hours. It took eight hours of steady exposure to create this image, and the image was quite difficult to see. One of you is writing about uh, Neef's first image, so we'll learn more about that in our discussion. But essentially, um, Neef then dies in 1833, and Daguerre wants to build on, on what he's figured out and kind of figure out how to make it better, how to shorten that exposure time, how to make it um, a more crisp image, a more clear image. Um, and so basically, Daguerre figures out two things. One is uh, latent development. So that's the first thing he figures out, and that's basically using chem chemicals to bring the image out. So not just using the exposure from light to um, impart the image, but to use chemicals to, to bring the image out because that makes the um, exposure time much less, okay? So that, that will make it sharper because it's not exposed to, and then there's slowly changing light which shifts the image and makes it blurry, right? So the first thing he figures out, latent development. The second thing also has to do with chemicals, it's called chemical fixing. So what this is, is making the image stay. So basically, um, when you expose something to light and you have a light sensitive material, uh, the longer it's exposed, the darker it gets until eventually the whole image just goes black. So you need to be able to stop that process so that um, the image, you can freeze the image in a certain level of exposure so that you can see everything in it and it doesn't black out. Um, so basically he figured out a way to chemically stop the action of the development, okay? So those two things, latent development, chemical fixing are figured out. Um, so then the daguerreotype kind of becomes the dominant method uh, all the way until the 1850s. Um, three weeks after the daguerreotype debuts, Talbot, the British guy, presents a paper on his um, photo, what did he call it? Photogenic drawings is what he called them. So he, he presents this paper, Photogenic Drawings, and he presents it to the Royal Institution in London on January 31st, 1839. Um, so Daguerre presents his thing January 7th, so literally three weeks later. Um, so let's find out about what Talbot was doing. It's always interesting when you look at history and inventions, you'll see in different parts of the world two people coming up with almost the same thing. It's this collective consciousness thing. It's very strange and interesting. Okay, so let's learn about Talbot. So Talbot, in 1835, he made um, negative images by placing objects on sensitized paper, okay, and exposing them to light. So the areas that were blocked by the objects on the paper would not be exposed to light, and they would stay light, and the, the rest would get dark as it's exposed to the light, okay? So this creates this kind of design of silhouettes. Um, if you've ever done, played around with cyanotypes or cyanotype paper um, in, I don't know, I feel like I did it in like summer camp or something. Okay, so that's the process. Um, so he then takes that paper and he exposes it to emulsion, which fixes it, okay? He names this process calotypes. And it's named after the Greek word kalos, which uh, means um, beauty, beautiful, to be beautiful. Um, okay, so his calotypes, though, are slightly blurred. They're a little bit grainy. They're not quite as precise of quality as the daguerreotypes because the texture of the paper um, kind of incorporates into the image because of the way the image is created. Um, 
And because of the blurriness and because of there were some difficulties in licensing this process, daguerreotype becomes more popular than calotype. Okay. Uh, so, January 7th, 1839, the daguerreotype is presented at the Academy of Science in Paris. Um, after that, people worldwide have access to it. How do we come up with these terms, like daguerreotype camera? Well, we know daguerreotype comes from Daguerre, who invented it. Camera is um, shortened from camera obscura, so that is where we get that term. And then the process being called photography is um, from two Greek words smushed together. So we have photos, which is the, the Greek word for light, and then we have uh, graphos, which is the Greek word for uh, drawing, but also writing, so mark making. It essentially, it means light mark making, or mark making with light is what photography literally means. Okay, um, so this is a huge invention, obviously, for, for a lot of reasons. Can you imagine like what the world how different the world would be without photography photography was never invented it's kind of crazy to think about now that we all carry high definition cameras in our pockets essentially on our cell phones um so this in invention affects a lot of things um including painting so there are two big ways that it affects painting and one of them is that it becomes a tool for painters Right, because you can now, instead of having your models sit all day, you can take a photo of them in a pose and use that to reproduce it as a painting or a photo of a landscape or whatever you're painting. So that's one aspect, though we still don't have color photography yet, so you're just kind of getting the shape, the value, and the lines, not the color. The other, and I think the bigger impact the photography has on painting is that it kind of, um, it releases painting from the burden of representation. Part of this comes from um, my background as an abstract painter. So this is something that's very interesting to me personally as well as professionally. But basically up until this point, painting, drawing, engraving, these kind of art forms were the only ways to record visual information. And so um, people who were artists kind of had this pressure in some way that the use of their talent had to be to record things essentially like that their primary function was representation and once photography has been is invented that no longer has to be the primary function of artists of painters and sculptors it sort of liberates them to pursue other creative interests which we can see is already kind of happening remember when we looked at some of the paintings last time with the um, realists who are becoming more interested in not depicting things exactly how they are, but imbuing them with emotion and, and thinking about how, what the painting itself is, its flatness, its relationship to the surface. So photography pushes those ideas forward more because it's like, well, now this new thing is developing and it's, it's able to literally capture the actual image. So painting can, no, no painting no longer has to do that, essentially. Um, okay, so unlike contemporary, photography, uh, daguerreotypes, interestingly, are, are printed from single plates, okay? So contemporary photography, well, right now it's digital, right? You can reproduce that as many times as you want. Before that, um, photography uses film, and the film produces a negative, and as long as you have the negative, you can reproduce as many prints of that as you want, right? Well, with daguerreotypes, that's not the case. You have your original plate, you can get one good print off it, and then you might get an echo print, which isn't quite as precise as the first print. So essentially, every single daguerreotype is completely unique. So it, in that way, also has a kind of relationship to painting, in that it's not something that can be reproduced over and over again at this point, okay? So it's a little bit, so when we're thinking about early photography, it's, it's important to distinguish it from what we know as contemporary or, or modern photography. Um, okay, so let's let's look at this particular image. This is one of the very earliest um, images by Daguerre. This is still life in studio. And you can tell that he was very conscientious of what he was doing. And he was very interested in photography, not just as a technological invention or something to help him create his sets and, and, and for a practical purpose, but he was very interested in its role as a arts medium, okay? And, and how do we know that? Well, one, he, he wrote about it some, but two, he 
Fashions a still life. He's making reference to earlier art forms. He very carefully composes this, and he's thinking about photography as this, as having this place in visual arts uh, lineage, and and in having this connection to art history, which is pretty interesting. Um, in this, you can see the texture of the paper is present. That's more present in uh, calotypes than in daguerreotypes, but you can still kind of see it here. You can see the high contrast. But you can see all the, um, the the lines, and you can imagine how it would feel to produce something like this at this time that was thought to be impossible. So this was a pretty incredible achievement, certainly. Let's look at another early daguerreotype. Okay, so in the United States, so after um, Daguerre invents this and presents it in Paris, he is paid for his um, invention, but the the technology is made available to be produced, and so people in different parts of the world are able to have access to Daguerre cameras and to um, create works of their own and open their own studios and things. Uh, and oh, an example of those people are when we go over to the United States, we have this um, let's see, pharmacist named uh, Josiah Johnson Hawes. Uh, he lives from 1808 to 1901. And then we have um, Albert Sands uh, Southworth. He's a teacher, so we have a pharmacist and a teacher. Um, Southworth lives from 1811 to 1894. And so they're both very interested in this new technology and in this this thing that Daguerre has, in, has invented. So they open up kind of a side business, you know. So they create a daguerreotype studio in Boston, which is where they live, and they specialize in portraiture. So the daguerreotype um, has a, a, a much faster exposure time than um, Neep's original photography process, which was eight hours. The daguerreotype still takes a long time, um, so much so that they, these guys actually invent a head brace that helps the people sitting for their portrait to stay still and not move their head back and forth so that their faces will be in focus in the portraiture. Um, so it's, you know, it takes, it's not like the photography we have today. Um, but so they have this, this uh, portrait studio that people come in to have their, their portraits made, but then they also start to see the potential that photography has to document important events and document interesting current events. And particularly for them, they were both very interested in science. So they thought documenting um, other scientific significant, uh, events that have scientific significance should be documented. So they uh, go to Massachusetts General Hospital with their daguerreotype and they go into the operating theater and in an operating theater, like you may remember from some of the paintings we've looked at. So the operation happens down here and you can kind of sit up above and look down. So they set up their Daguerre camera uh, up above and take a photo of this surgery that's happening. So this is an early surgery that's being done with um, ether. So the patient has been put under with ether. You can see some of the people are a little blurry because they're moving because surgery is happening. Um, but they think this is an important thing to document. So we have this early daguerreotype of an early surgery being done, which is pretty interesting in several different historical levels. It's also interesting from a visual arts perspective because we have this image captured from above, which we haven't really seen before. And what it does is it kind of flattens our figures out, right? So we already have this interest coming out of 19th century realism where the the painting as a painting being a kind of level of realism and the interest in the flatness of the surface area. And then we start seeing these kind of interesting things photography is doing that are also flattening perspective from these different vantage points, like from above. So artists of the time see this and it kind of gets their, their minds worrying about different kinds of ideas about perspective and different ideas about um, how images can be oriented, essentially. So several artists of the time see this image and are, are very interested in this as um, what it can mean for composition in painting. Okay, so this is a big deal. We can record something that is happening as it's happening um, with this new technology. Okay, let's hop back over to Europe.
Uh, so we have an artist um, called Gaspard Felix Torchnachon. Um, he's known simply as Nadar. That is what he went by. Uh, he lives from 1820 to 1910, and he's um, he's an artist in that he he likes to do caricatures of people. So he's he's um, his day job is he's a journalist. He's also a novelist. He's also a professional balloonist. So he would take you around in his hot air balloon, um, and then on the side he liked to do caricatures of people, which are like those silly little exaggerated kind of cartoon cartoony illustration drawings. So he does all of those things, um, and he gets very fascinated by photography. He opens a portraiture studio, and he, in his studio, photographs some of the most culturally significant people at the time. Uh, Delacroix, Courbet, Daumier, Manet, all of those guys come in and get their portrait made. And this one we have Eugene Delacroix. This is at the height of his career. And in this portrait, um, we see something different from some of the other daguerreotype portraits of the time. You can kind of get a feel for his personality. So the way it's composed and the way he uses the um, short focus of the camera to kind of really fix in on his face, the way it's lit, you kind of get a feeling of who Delacroix was. So I like to use this example since we looked at Delacroix's uh, paintings two lectures ago when we were talking about romanticism. But it really, um, it, it kind of shows what can be done in terms of portraiture with this early photography technology, okay? Okay, let's go back up to England. Uh, so Julia Margaret Cameron, who lives from 1815 to 1879, she is the most famous English photographer in the 19th century. And um, she's a portraitist. She does a lot of portraits. She does some daguerreotype, but she much um, prefers the calotype. And then she also is doing these album prints, which is a different kind of printing technique for the time um, that creates this kind of fuzzy, soft focus look. Um, she does portraits of a lot of uh, famous, important people, including Charles Darwin, including uh, Tennyson. So she's doing portraits of very famous people. Um, she also did a ton of portraits of women, um, of women of note, famous noble women, but also just of her uh, female friends. And she would pose them and um, create these kind of um, more narrative, more art artistically motivated kind of works. Not, not to say that portraiture is not artistic, but not just straight like portraiture, like here is Eugene Delacroix. She would do things, um, she, was, she was interested in telling stories with photography and in, in narrative photography, basically. Uh, to kind of lend that um, quality to her work, she had portraits that were titled after the people that she was shooting. And then she also had works where she titled them after literary characters, sometimes also characters from the Bible or characters from mythology. So in this one, um, her friend is posing and she calls it Ophelia, study number two. Ophelia, of course, from Shakespeare, right, from Hamlet. Um, and she did a whole series of these Ophelia portraits in which the subject looks a little dazed. She looks a little out of sorts. She looks like she's sort of staring off. Maybe she's a little lost, which if you remember your Hamlet is accurate for Ophelia. Um, so basically she creates this um, different kind of feel. She tries to introduce more expressive qualities into the photography, which is pretty incredible to think to do um, with something that's so new and, and such an early technology. The blurriness kind of becomes her signature, and it adds this kind of dreamlike, ethereal sort of quality to the images that she produces. So she's pretty interesting, and, and if you have an interest in um, photography and the way it develops as a, an artistic medium, she's certainly someone to look into further. Okay, back over to America. Uh, this is Timothy O'Sullivan. He is one of the earlier guys to um, to kind of realize and then utilize the potential photography has um, to document things. It's like it's documentary function, okay? 
Um, so that seems really obvious to, to us now, but people were thinking of it more as like a still portraiture or going maybe in, in setting up something a little bit narrative, like Cameron, maybe going and capturing um, some events uh, like Haas. But he really saw that it was something that could have an, a, a big impact outside of itself. So um, he did things like this. So this is a photo from um, the aftermath of uh, Gettysburg, which is, of course, the most deadly battle of the Civil War, the American Civil War. So he goes to this battlefield um, after this really terrible battle, and he sets up his camera and he, he shoots it. He takes photos um, of the, the bodies, the, the deceased, the, people, the men who were killed in the battle. And up until this time, if you got a newspaper, the illustrations would be um, either hand illustrations, but often they'd be engravings. So they'd be newsprint engravings, like printed just showing kind of the outline of something to illustrate what was happening. Um, so the impact of a photo, which is obviously more realistic and it kind of brings the viewer in closer contact and maybe makes this more real, makes it a more, more present reality for the person looking at it. Um, that was a huge impact. People, people had not seen anything like this. Um, and to have this kind of horror represented to them was, was pretty powerful at the time. And so he's the first person to really capitalize on that idea to, to use photography as an agent of the press, right? Um, so it has a profound influence on uh, public life. Um, because events can now be recorded relatively quickly and accurately, okay? Um, so this shows us the high price of war. It showed people at the time the high price of war in a way that was more real, that wasn't just abstract numbers, right? When we hear numbers of people who were killed in a battle, we know it's terrible in like a conceptual way, but to see the actual bodies is something quite different. Um, and this type of photo just makes an impression that nothing up to this point really had. So it, it, it really um, shocks people, basically. Okay, the last thing we're gonna talk about when we talk about early photography, and we'll talk about photography more when we get into modernism. Um, I mean, the very early photography isn't the end all be all of photography, obviously. There's, there's tons of very relevant and interesting photography that happens throughout the history of modern and contemporary art. And we will talk about more people, but for today, for early photography, the last guy we're going to talk about is this guy. Oh, I hate that I didn't catch that. So my autocorrect changed the spelling of his name. That is not how you spell this person's name. It's the craziest spelling of Edward I've actually ever seen. I'm sorry I didn't capture that. I'll fix it in the notes. But it's E-A-D-W-E-A-R-D. -E so my computer just thought I was having a stroke or something and changed it to Edward. But that is not how you spell his name. Um, so Edward... Uh, Moybridge, he is born in 1830, he dies in 1904, and he's a realist, he's very interested in the realist art movement, um, so he translates that into photography. Um, he's also a scientist, so he has this scientific background as well. Um, he is originally from England, but he moves to San Francisco in the United States sometime in the 1850s, I don't know exactly when. And he sets up a studio, and he becomes well known for his, um, not for portraiture, but for his photos of the American West. So he's kind of interested in the same kind of things as like Thomas Cole, who we looked at uh, when we were looking at romanticism, and um, capturing the beautiful landscapes of the American West. So he's kind of the first photographer to be really interested in landscape photography. So that's the first thing he does, but that's not what he's really famous for. Um, he becomes well known for this. So in 1872, um, Leland Stanford, who is in 1872, he's the governor of California. So Governor Stanford uh, calls up Moybridge and he says, hey, I need you to help me out with something. I need you to settle a bet for me. So Governor Stanford had been out probably drinking with some of his buddies at a racetrack, watching horses, and they had this bet going. His friend thought that the horse's hooves, at least one was on the ground at all times. 
Governor Stanford thought that at one point all four horses' hooves were off the ground when it was at a fast gallop. And so <coughs> the governor is like, hey, I'm the governor. I know a guy. I'll call this famous uh, photographer up. He does these these new confounded pictures and, and have him figure this out for me. So Roy Rich goes and he sets up his camera and he takes um, super fast, like a very quick shutter speed um, photos of this horse. He takes a bunch of the photos of the horse and he's able to capture the moment, if you look at the top here, where all four of its hooves are off the ground at the same time. Governor Stanford wins his bet. Um, but what is fascinating about this is that we now have sequential photography. Um, so through the sequential photography, he's able to show that yes, all the horse's feet do come off the ground at one point. Um, but this makes a, an impact in the scientific realm because we can capture things that the human eye is unable to see. And it's like, oh my gosh, cameras, we've improved them and now they can catch things that are too fast for our eyes to detect. That's pretty crazy. That will have scientific uses. Uh, so there's that impact. And then there's also an impact in, in the art world, right? So this influences other artists who are very interested in motion. Um, one who comes to mind who we'll talk about next when we talk about Impressionism is Degas. Degas becomes very interested in this idea of capturing motion um, artistically, and he kind of gets the idea of being interested in motion from Moybridge. This is very famous. This horse bet thing is, is kind of talked about all of the, the Western world. Um, and so he creates this device, Moybridge, called a zupraxoscope. And what this thing does is it projects each of these individual images quite large on the wall behind it, and it projects them in rapid succession. And so when you have sequential photography that you're projecting in rapid succession, what are you doing? You're animating, right? You're essentially animating. You're um, creating uh, a very early ancestor of the motion picture, right? So this is a totally groundbreaking idea. It's kind of the heart of the idea behind motion pictures, behind movies, behind film. And so this little settling of a bet for the governor of California ends up leading to the invention of cinema and the uh, invention of motion pictures and film, um, which is a natural relative of photography. Right? So that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so that is early photography. Um, you can look at the notes on this for a little bit more information about some of the early philosophical ideas that contribute to the development of early photography. Um, and make sure you do your discussion post. Make sure you do your quiz, which you have a little more time for. Um, all right. Next time we will talk about Impressionism.